Gary Zimmer, and you're sitting in our farm office in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. Yeah, I guess southwest of Spring Green. When we started out, my son said, why did you sell in these, that on these hills? Why didn't you go to Illinois and buy nice and black rich ground? I said, why, when you're a one-year-old, you didn't tell me you wanted to farm. He said, I would probably settle somewhere else. This was hilly, rough ground. We farmed on a 45-mile circle, and we had a lot of little fields and lots of different small acres and if we buy a hundred acre farm we're lucky to have 30 decent tillable acres and the rest of us woods and pasture and rough land that's what we farm anyway this is where uh, i started a business in biological farming i'm a dairy nutritionist and got into soils to create better feed for cows so i was teaching at a technical college in minnesota that started my career that was in the mid 70s and so anyway i got involved and i went i got started an acres conference i've been going 40 years now I got involved with him because to a farmer and he got me to speak there and I got done speaking and Chuck Walters came up afterwards and he said, boy, he said, that was, you had a lot of really interesting information. He said, but you talk so fast. He said, I think they all missed it. You need to write a book. I'll help you. Let's write a book. And that's what started the books. And then the books took me 10 years to get the first one out. And this is a revised edition of it. And it was 300 some pages. And this is one that's really quite popular uh, for guys that aren't as depth in school it's more like going to a winter meeting I'm near the science and chemistry and then we redid the first one first one is 365 pages i told him a page a day for a year and you got it man and then this one here now 500 i took chapters off because now i'm not writing another one of those kind of, all the things that need to be there but since that book there's more in this book now is about more in carbon and biology i was trained in the albrick system back in the 70s and change the minerals changes everything and i got some really good pictures of farms that did nothing but change minerals and their soils are loose and crumbly and healthy they didn't grow cover crops they didn't put on compost and they grow corn and beans and their soils are unbelievable but they did change their minerals and that's how i was trained well now as time goes on compost and cover crops and you know balanced fertility all these things are bigger topics and now it's regeneration and and biochar so there's always something new coming along but regeneration is not a new word either now i like it actually because the first new farming system came along was called sustainable and I said, well, because there was no interest rates were high in the 80s, you couldn't get any money from anybody, so they were going to do nothing and become sustainable. Where did that movement go? It wasn't sustainable because they never fixed it. I say, now the regenerative is really nice. Regenerate your land and then become sustainable after you fixed it, after it's really doing well. You've got to earn the right not to do anything. And that's where sustainable fell apart. So I actually kind of like to regenerate. I have a lot of fun with what are you regenerating? So now it makes it a question because the rules to regenerative came from some people. They think you got to have livestock. And they think you got to put on compost. And they think you got to be no-till. If you think you have to do those practices, and those are the only ones that can be regenerative, you're absolutely missing the boat. And you might have to do something totally different than I'd have to do, wherever you're farming, whatever you're growing. But usually there's common ground. My rules to biological farming are pretty powerful. You deal with the chemistry, the physical, and the biology. And that's what you deal with all three of those. So what's your, what's your constraint? What's your limiting factor? That's why I said biological farming, a lot of guys come back and they start this thing and said, wow, he said, never thought farming could be so fun. They're slaves to agribusiness. Right now, a lot of them are, and that's not fun. So why are they taking charge of their farm, whatever that might be? And nowadays, they're not alone. Back 20 years ago, they were the lone ranger. People criticized them, laughed at them. And <laughs> you know how it was. But nowadays, now that, that just, that, that's acceptable. So I, said, I think they get from the book the fact that, aha, Let's work on my bases out here, whether it be take your rotation. Nothing up, but count yourself and boring on your soul. If that's all you got, that's all. start there. Take your rotation, whatever that might be. Now, if you got corn beans, you got to come up with a cover crop system. It might be rye. Our biggest market for the rye is going to be cover crops. Resell and seed. And that's, and, that's, and that's the only thing a lot of these guys can plant after they get corn harvested up here. And it's the only thing that's really tough and easy. They're going to fly some on in August. They're going to pay these farmers in Iowa to do it. In Minnesota last year, they were between uh, 50 and $90 an acre to grow a cover crop. Maryland has the million acre challenge. That's most of the tillage land in Maryland. They're willing to pay 65 to $75 an acre to get you to grow a cover crop. And then they got rules and requirements. You have to let it grow a certain amount if you want to get your check and all these kind of things. What they do need is to teach them how to manage it so it doesn't hurt their yields. See, a year ago, we sold a lot of rice. And half those guys never came back. Because they planted rye a year ago, two years ago, I and the last spring it was bone dry, and they let it get knee high. It sucked out all the moisture. Then they planted corn, nothing grew. So now they're never going to plant rye again. It's not rye's fault. It's the management of the rye. When it's this big, they should have burned it or took it down. There's a guy from Winona County, Winona, Minnesota, and some of these guys might be interesting stories. 
He was a dairy farmer. He's all in hotel. He spoke at the meetings in Minnesota with me. He plants rye in fall after corn and beans. It's really interesting. And he plants it around the first week in October. How does he get his corn and beans? The first guy to harvest corn and beans. He's the first guy to plant them the following spring. When the rye gets about this tall, he said, you dare not let it get over eight inches tall or six inches tall. And he said, I'm the first guy to plant because my rye allows me to go out there under wetter conditions than most farmers can plant their crops in because I got a blanket of rye. But he planted the first week in October. So it's a pretty thick, dense crop. I saw pictures of it. And then he plants his corn and then he plants his beans. He's all alone. And then he sprays them. He said, now if it gets, he said, nervous. Now the winter's been too good. He said, if the rye gets too big, I got to plant the corn and spray it. I have to, I already got so much tractors and I'm alone, I have to spray and then go plant the beans and then spray again. I want to do it all at one time. So then, and he plants 95 day corn. Everybody else plants 105, 110 day corn. I got to get a shorter day corn so I can get it out by the 1st of October to fit this system. And so now he dropped his insecticides. He's got his chemicals way down. He already used his soil structure. It's unbelievable. Water's filtering. He's got more resilience. And that's what needs to be taught on how to do it. And that's what guys finger with rot. So then the rye, you're right. So then 30 bushel an acre, and if we get $10 a bushel off the farm, we, we've sold some, 10 is about all we can get for the, and my daughter bags it, markets it, cleans it. We got a little rock mill we own the mill down there. There's the old feed mills are empty everywhere, so we got that on bankruptcy deal. But anyway, so we got storage bins there, and then we can bag it and clean it and process it and put it. We got super sacks of rye leaving this week, tomorrow, going to the state of Oregon in super sacks for a flour mill, for a bakery. Nobody in Oregon, you can grow orchard grass, all the demands for fescues and orchards and rye. Why in the world would they grow rye and no money in it? So they won't, they can't get rye. So we're shipping rye from Wisconsin to the state of Oregon. Seems really dumb. He's willing to pay an ungodly amount of money for it. We just want what we want to get. He's going to be half as much in trucking as he is for the rye. And someone's going to mark it up along the way. But anyway, the rye, and so yes, let's say we get 30 bushels over $10 worth of $300 an acre. Our average rent is probably 125 around here. We got some at, you're getting glad we pay some at 200 for Spanians to do. So let's say we got our 125, but that also affects our yield potential. We got sandy loams, clay rocks, we got, right, you name it, we got it all. We got some good land, but out of the 1,500, uh, uh, we probably got four or 500 really good, and the rest is everything else. So for a real land, I went over 200 bushel last year in the middle of the drought around here. But you know, some of this land right here is pretty incredible right around here. But we have some that made 40. So we don't make any money on the rye then. But then the rye is really the clover. So now for the corn, all our nitrogen, our soil structure improvements, so we control is better. We gave the land an 18-month rest. I'm a real believer, like I said, in shallow incorporating residues. Our soil structures are unbelievable. We plant down in furrows, and we'll take these cover crops down in the spring. So our money we make on corn. Now, on our good land, we can get 200 bushel corn. We average 170. Now, last year, sure, it was off. We average 170, and we normally get $10 a bushel for corn. Now, right now, we're selling it at 850. Bill's Organic Eggs is 10 miles from here. And, they, and we get all the manure from them, and we sell them all the corn. We run all our corn through a grain cleaner. People don't realize, last year, we sold corn in Indiana. The guy that would buy egg innovations, they said, we, it's got to be yellow and it's got to have a high test weight. We can't find any. Well, I was, we ran it through a grain. I, I, I thought corn was yellow. He said, no, no, it comes in black and moldy and crappy. <laughs> so, so they buy all our corn. And I know that we're going to deliver corn tomorrow. If we got a contract some from spring yet. But then we're going to be, so they, but we get the manure for free. So this farm is the only truly organic farm that everything is organic, including the manure we put on the land. It's all coming from organic chickens that we feed. And then we buy sulfur and boron. So then our input costs to grow this corn are very, very, very minimal. So we got a nice, unique setup in this area. And that what we sell, we grow more corn than they buy. And my son will probably cut his acres down now that he's really alone. Just keep that contract going and we'll get rye markets going. So our whole farm system, my son, now granted, I didn't, I covered all the expenses I could. And I didn't put a land, I did put a, a Hundred dollar an acre, hundred twenty dollar an acre land cost. That's our land cost. This farm, my son's goal is to net five hundred dollars an acre on all fifteen hundred acres. Now that's not a part time job. Now the corn prices are down three dollars a bushel this year, uh, uh, and he grows a hundred thousand bushel of corn. That's not called a slight pay cut. That's called a huge damn pay cut. And you better be established like him to survive it. He'll survive it. He'll do fine. We have some pastures and some hay on just bad spots and odd fields. That's probably going to leave. We've got, we got 700 acres of corn and 700. Now, this year we don't have 700 acres of rye. But anyway, so we'll have about 700 acres of each. So my son probably would like to get it down to five, 600 acres of each.